Hi folks, Damon here. It's been a while since you've seen me on camera, but I wanted to take the chance today to answer a question that commonly comes up when folks start looking at EMR. And that question is, what deployment mode of EMR should I use? There's EMR and EC2, there's EMR and EKS, and there's EMR serverless, and it's not always clear what the benefits of one are over the other. So today, I'm gonna to walk through those three different deployment modes and kind of show you the highlights of what are the trade-offs between each one. Let's start with EMR and EC2. This is the classic, right? This has been around forever, and this gives you the most uh, customization and flexibility possible with your EMR uh, with your EMR deployment. So let me take a look at the console here. When I go ahead and create a cluster in the EMR console, um, we have a ton of different options to configure that cluster. We have these application bundles that you can use by default, but look at all these other options here, right? You can do Flink, you can do Livy, you can do Hue, you can install even Pig if you want to, right? And I know there's still some folks out there that are using Pig. Um, so you have a ton of flexibility and a ton of different open source frameworks. The other thing about EMR and EC2 is, as it sounds, it's on EC2, right? So you get instances that you have root access on. Um, you can configure those instances using uh, bootstrap actions. So if we go down here, this is just a shell script that you run on the cluster at boot time, but you can do anything with that shell script. Uh, you can customize your instances. You can install different frameworks. I've had folks install geospatial software like Apache Sedona. So a lot of different things you can do to those those instances. And there's also a ton of different instances you can choose, right? So if we go back up here on the instance configuration page, and for my primary node, if I choose an EC2 instance type, um, you can see that scroll bar is pretty big, right? We support a ton of different instance types on EMR and EC2. So if you need a specific instance type for your workload, lots of folks need compute specific instance types or GPU specific instance types, right? You can choose the instance type that is right for your workload. And that's one of the great things about EMR and EC2 is that flexibility. You can also choose a ton of it, different instance types. I've had folks running clusters with hundreds and hundreds of instances across multiple different instance types. That's one of the great things about instance fleets is you can choose multiple different instance types to populate your core or task groups on EMR. So um, a lot of different ways to mix and match, configure, change things, optimize things. So it's great if you uh, want to get way deep into the weeds and you know exactly uh, the ins and outs of everything that's happening on AWS. So that's one of the great benefits of EMR on EC2. I'm gonna to switch to the other end of the spectrum now, which is EMR serverless. And with EMR serverless, we wanted to make it as easy as possible to get up and running. So if I go over to EMR Studio, where you have the serverless console, if I create an application, new app, and I can make it a Spark. EMR Serverless only supports Spark and Hive frameworks today, but we have the same release version that we use with EMR and EC2, and that's true across all the different EMR deployment modes. So I can choose EMR 6.13 here. I can choose between x86 and ARM64, and then I can just click Go. Um, by default, I have some maximum capacity set up with my application. Glue is set up as the data catalog, but I just hit Create Application, and I'm ready to go. So there's my new app right there, and I can start the application right away. And if I'm using something called pre-initialized capacity, that's also spinning up capacity for me to use in the background. And then if I want to submit a sample job, we've got this beautiful button right here, um, and I can choose an EMR serverless job role, and that's just going to go run that Spark examples jar, the, the common Spark Pi script, right? So in as little time as I've been talking to you, I spun up an EMR serverless application and spun up a job running on that application. I can, of course, tweak and tune things when I create a new job, right? I can go in here and I can change my uh, Spark executor cores if I know that I need a certain number of cores or a certain amount of memory for my um, Spark application, but I can just leave it as default as well. The DMR serverless uh, uses Spark's dynamic allocation to kind of spin up, um, spin up new resources and spin those down as they need by your job. So it's really, really easy to get started on EMR serverless. The other big benefit there too is you only pay for the runtime of your job. 
So with an EMR on EC2 cluster, you're paying for that cluster to run. If you have a persistent cluster, you'll pay for that EC2 instance and EMR while that cluster is running, even if nothing is running on that cluster, which for some folks is totally fine, right? And in many cases, totally necessary. With EMR serverless, you only pay for the runtime of your job, or if you're using pre-initialized capacity, the capacity for that application while it's running. And of course, um, if I go back to the application here, if I configure my application, even with pre-initialized capacity this is an optional thing I can configure the application to automatically shut down too so if no jobs have been submitted to the application I can shut it down after 15 minutes if a job gets submitted the application can automatically start back up so if you're just getting started with spark if you're just getting started with EMR it's a really easy way to kind of get up and going with with EMR so on one side of the spectrum, we have configurability. On the other side of the spectrum, we have ease of use. And in the middle of the spectrum, we have EMR on EKS. Now let's take a look at the docs really quickly to see, um, we have this page uh, right at the beginning of the EMR and EKS docs. And this also helps explain a little bit of the difference between EMR and EC2 and EMR on EKS. So you can see here on EMR and EC2, you're responsible for everything, right? You're responsible for the EC2 instances and the operating system and Yarn and Spark and EMR. Um, you specify all of this information and we take that and run those clusters for you, right? With EMR and EKS, it's a little bit different. EKS takes care of the underlying compute resources and takes care of scaling those resources up and down. And then you deploy your EMR components on top of EKS. Now this is great uh, if you're familiar with EKS and if you're familiar with Kubernetes. It can take a long time to get familiar with those workloads, right? Even if you're using EKS, you still need to be able to manage Kubernetes. You still need to be familiar with all the different uh, terms and skills it takes to manage Kubernetes, whether that's creating new node groups to add capacity to an EKS cluster or making the decision between EC2 and Fargate. You do still have a ton of flexibility with EKS. You can choose your instance types there. You can choose GPU instances there. You can do a ton of configurability, um, but uh, it requires you to know Kubernetes and know EKS. And that's a that's a big ask for a lot of folks, right? Um, it's it's no small no small thing to manage those clusters. The other thing about EMR and EKS as well uh, is we have support for both Spark and Flink now in preview. So you can run your Spark and Flink jobs on EMR and EKS. So that's the other thing that's a little bit different. So that is a quick overview of the different deployment modes of EMR on EC2 and EKS and serverless. I hope that's useful. If you have any questions, feel free to drop it in the comments and I'll answer them as they come in. Have a great one. Bye.